Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, how are you? Welcome to another X12 lecture without border. Today is another super lovely summer, summer day here in the UK. I don't know why every time we have lectures, the weather is just so fabulous. So hope you all have a great day and a fantastic mood. Um, so welcome to join us. Uh, let me see how to do next one. Uh, yeah. So uh, welcome to join this community. No matter you are a new friend or our old friend who has been with XFAL for a long time, we are really trying very hard to hope that what we can do can uh, create a lot of value for you. Yeah, XFAL is still very young but growing so fast. Um, recently, we have established the sponsorship relationship with the Royal College of the Pathologists in the UK. If you don't know, it is one of the biggest institutions for the pathologist that was founded in 1962. There will be more collaborations and initiatives. So for example, we are currently developing training courses for veterinary pathologists at different levels. So please let us know if you're interested or have any other suggestions. We always listen to your feedback. So for example, many of you, I think mentioned in our feedback form that our two hour session may be a little bit too long. So uh, today's session will be one hour, okay? So um, today we are very, very honored to have Dr. Stephis Gothis with us to discuss veterinary public health and the zoos, zoonosis. I think it's a very timely topic. We know that our XVAL lecture participants are very international from more than 50 countries. So no matter you're from an area where COVID-19 as the latest zoonotic disease is absolutely well controlled or are still suffering from the first wave or may expecting the second wave, I think this topic could be very relevant for everyone. So um, first, uh, let me give you a full introduction our, of our speakers today. Dr. Stathis Gothis is a lecturer in mole, <coughs> molecular virology, virology uh, at the University of Ethics, University School of Life Science, and honorary research fellow at the Imperial College London. He graduated from the School of Veterinary Medicine in Aristotle University, Greece in 2001 and received his MSc in Biotechnology in 2002 and also PhD in Molecular Microbiology in 2006 from the Oster and Illinois State Universities. Since 2009, he worked at the Roslin Institution, the Royal Veterinary College London, the University of Copenhagen in the field at, at the in the field of pathogen pathogen host interactions. In 2020, this year, he joined the University of Ethics to establish his own research group with a primary focus on the SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus. His research started from the interface of human-animal health, the use of the uh, transcriptomics technology to answer scientific questions. Since joining the Imperial College London in 2012, his research has moved to focus on the host cell entry and the transmission of the zoonotic uh, virus variant and the pet bone viruses using the big data technology and the bioinformatics. So before we start our fabulous lecture today, uh, can I quickly give you some reminders? So during the lecture, um, you will be all muted and you will provide chance to ask questions at the end. And please act professionally and respectfully in the chat box. And also our lecture will be streamed together on our Twitter account, which you can find here. And also you can find our previous lectures and also coming lectures on our website as well. So um, very welcome. Uh, so um, 
So that is, should I hand the stage to you? Very welcome, hello. Hi everyone, uh, hi from London. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can, hello, welcome. Uh, so, uh, I would like to thank first the XWOW team for uh, inviting me here. I mean, this um, Lecture Without Borders is an amazing initiative, very inspiring indeed. Um, so, I'm really glad to be here, uh, really glad to be supporting your cause uh, and talking, uh, presenting uh, about zoonosis to so many people across the world. So, um, just to give you a bit of introduction, although you've done a very good job. Uh, my name is Tati Jotis. Um, I'm originally a vet. I'm currently a lecturer in virology at the University of Essex, and I'm also affiliated with Imperial College in London, where I have been working uh, for the last uh, 10 years. My recent work is primarily focused on uh, the factors uh, that allow viruses in particular to jump from animals um, to humans and cause disease. Um, so um, I would like, uh, today I will give you um, an overview uh, of the factors um, that lead to the emergence um, of zoonosis. Um, I will talk about coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2, which is obviously uh, the hot topic these days. Um, I will also talk about uh, influenza viruses as an example of an important zoonosis. I will briefly mention and talk about uh, bats and bat influenza viruses. And finally, I will talk about what we can do to prevent uh, zoonotic uh, diseases. Please let me know if there's any problem with the sound. Um, talk to me while I'm talking. I'm not sure if there's any, uh, if the sound is well. Okay, so um, as you all know, we're in the middle of uh, a global pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, which is caused by coronavirus, uh, which is SARS-CoV-2. So I think it's very important to remember that um, this is not unprecedented. This pandemic is not unprecedented. Uh, there have been uh, many more deadly pandemics throughout human history and um, and even though even so, uh, the humans always manage to uh, persevere. Uh, another important thing to remember is in the context of this talk today is that most of the pathogens that caused these pandemics uh, came from animals. So the earliest known documentation of an animal disease that was transferred to humans goes back to 2000 BC in Mesopotamia. And it was a cautionary tale about uh, a man who got infected from a rabies infected dog. So the most lethal uh, pandemic uh, in the human history was black death or uh, bubonic plague. I don't know why it does that. <laughs> I thought I chose the laser. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why it does that anyway. So it was black death or bubonic plague which caused in the middle ages killed almost 200 million uh, uh, people. Um, and um, this plague was caused by a bacterium called uh, Yersinia pestis, which came from fleece infested rats. Um, there are also more, a lot more uh, animal diseases that were transmitted to humans in the last century. For example, avian flu pandemics that came from birds, even HIV is now believed to come from chimpanzees, uh, from a type of chimpanzee in the west uh, of Africa. And all of these uh, pandemics uh, and animal diseases show very well how uh, closely connected animal uh, and human disease are. They are very interrelated and interconnected. And this is uh, really well summarized in the concept uh, of veterinary public health, which is actually the application of veterinary skills in order to improve uh, human health. This is obviously a very broad concept and uh, includes and involves um, the animal welfare, environmental um, protection, um, uh, food production and safety, 
and of course prevention and control of zoonotic uh, diseases. Another relevant and very important concept is that of one medicine, one health approach, which is basically the partnership of experts from different sectors in order to achieve a better public health outcome. Um, and uh, this One Health involves basically the uh, designing and implementing of health programs, health policies, health legislation, or uh, research. Um, and it's all about the coordination, communication, and collaboration um, between um, environmentalists, ecologists, uh, veterinarians, physicians, uh, researchers, and so on in order to tackle very important health issues such as zoonosis. But what are zoonosis? So zoonosis or zoonotic diseases are basically human infectious diseases, um, which are caused by pathogenic uh, microorganisms that are spread from animals to humans. And this could be bacteria, viruses, parasites, or fungi. Um, not all um, animal diseases are zoonotic. That's important to remember. And also there are some diseases that are transferred um, from humans to animals. And these are called reverse zoonosis or anthropozoonosis. So I will be mentioning several um, terms and I decided to use some definitions in the beginning. I will be mentioning endemic, emerging or re-emerging diseases. I will be mentioning natural reservoir and spillover. So an endemic disease is a disease which is regularly found in a particular animal population or in a geographical area. Uh, emerging disease is a new disease that appears in the population for the very first time or an um, re-emerging disease is one that previously existed but is rapidly increasing in incidence or geographical uh, range. Now, natural reservoir or disease reservoir is um, one or more animal populations or even environments where the a pathogen is maintained. Um, and spillover is the process by which a pathogen moves from one host population to another. And we usually use this term to describe the process of um, that the uh, pathogens, how they jump from animals to humans. Uh, that's how we use it more often. Yep. So, um, zoonoses are very uh, common. Almost 60% of existing human infectious diseases are zoonotic. At least 75% of in emerging infectious diseases, West Nile virus, Ebola, flu, uh, come from animals. And three out of five new human diseases that appear every year uh, also come from animals. It's also interesting that 80% of agents that have uh, potential bioterrorist use are zoonotic pathogens, which shows you that the impact of zoonotic disease is wider in uh, societies. So the zoonosis are truly a global issue. Its effects have an impact um, to local uh, communities or wider uh, communities and economies and also sustainable development, especially in developing uh, countries. Uh, the many examples of um, zoonosis, uh, for example, bovine spongiform gypalopathies or mad cow disease that came from cows in the UK, Ebola, which came from bats in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Lassa virus, which came from rodents, um, hypotogenicity influenza viruses that came from birds, and I will talk about this a bit more and so many more uh, examples of zoonosis. Currently, the most prevalent uh, zoonotic disease is considered uh, is uh, leptospirosis, which comes from mice and cause uh, uh, meningitis uh, in humans or liver or renal uh, failure. So zoonosis are classified into several different uh, categories. We have the direct zoonosis, uh, which involves a vertebrate host, which is actually any creature with a spine. Uh, so in this category, the pathogen uh, is directly uh, transferred from one vertebrate host to the other, and it doesn't get amplified or developed in the meantime, in the middle. Uh, so a typical example is avian flu or rabies. 
Um, cyclozoonosis is another um, example uh, of zoonosis, and these uh, diseases involve more than one vertebrate host. A typical one is echinococcosis. Um, and then we have metazoonosis, which involves an invertebrate host, such as a mosquito, which is often called an amplifying host because the pathogen is amplified uh, or adapted in this uh, intermediary host before it jumps on to human. There are many examples like West Nile virus, um, Zika virus, yellow fever, and so on. And the last category are saprozoonosis, uh, which uh, involve non-animal reservoirs. Uh, it could be a plant um, or it could be non-abiotic environment, for example, water or soil. Um, and a typical example of a saprozoonosis is anthrax. Okay, so, uh, but how do zoonotic diseases, how do they, uh, how are they spread? So they can be spread in many different ways. They can spread uh, by bites or scratch from scratches from infected animals or by exposure to blood, saliva, and other fluids from infected animals and uh, by vectors such as mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas, we pick up the pathogen from an infected animal and transfer it to humans. They can also be transferred by the air, for example, with the respiratory droplets in flu and also with the coronavirus currently, and also uh, via contaminated surfaces, contaminated or undercooked meat or eggs, unpasteurized milk and milk products, raw fruits and vegetables, and so on. So um, people who are in direct contact with animals are obviously at high risk uh, to get uh, a zoonotic disease, um, such as farmers, veterinarians, zoo uh, workers, um, and people who are immunocompromised, such as pregnant women, uh, cancer patients, young children, or older people, uh, more likely to develop a more severe form of the zoonotic disease. However, everyone could get a zoonotic disease. Every single one of us can get um, a zoonotic disease. And it is estimated that globally about 1 million billion cases of illness and millions of deaths occur every year from uh, zoonosis. So um, the big question is, how do how are zoonotic diseases emerge in the first place? And their emergence is a very complex um, uh, process, and there are many aspects of it that we don't fully understand. So the key concepts I would like you to remember are the mutation rates of pathogens and the interface uh, of animals and humans. So these pathogens accumulate or circulate um, in uh, wildlife and domestic animal populations, and they accumulate mutations in their genomes, which allows them to evolve, to become um, more uh, resilient, uh, to adapt to changing conditions. Um, and um, as you can see in this graph, you can see the relationship between the mutation rate and the genome size of organisms. And you can see that the smaller uh, the genome of an organism, the higher is the mutation rate. And that explains why viruses mutate more often than bacteria and the eukaryotes. Sometimes these mutations allow these pathogens to jump from one animal to the other uh, or jump from animals to humans and cause disease. And this is a normal process. This happens anyway, uh, but it's a very random and a very slow process. And uh, but however, there are some factors or drivers uh, that, is, that are mainly due to human activities that can actually increase the interface or expand better the interface between uh, animals and humans, creating more opportunities for this uh, spillover to happen. And these um, factors or drivers are either social, geographical, political, ecological, and so on, and they are related to global uh, trends. One of them, perhaps one of the most important, is the rise in uh, the global human population, which in turn led to a rapid urbanization and deforestation, and, 
uh, which led to a destruction of uh, natural habitats for many wild animals, creating opportunities for spillover uh, of diseases from wild animals to the human uh, population. And this uh, rise in uh, population has also led to an increasing intensification or industrialization of farming systems, which also favored the emergence of new um, pathogens, zoonotic pathogens. For example, by um, housing densely uh, big numbers of domestic animals close to human populations, favors this transfer of pathogens from animals um, to uh, humans. Also, the increase in agricultural trade, the increase in international travel with tourism and migration has also made far more easier for these pathogens to spread at the global level than never before. And another important uh, aspect is uh, the climate change, um, which um, uh, actually expands the range of many infectious uh, diseases. Um, so as the planet heats up and becomes warmer, a lot of diseases that were uh, confined in uh, certain geographical areas in some countries are now expanding in range, and in particular vector-borne diseases, such as mosquito-borne or tick-borne diseases, um, uh, for example, dengue virus or malaria, they're expanding uh, slowly or in some cases much more quicker. And also the, um, the climate change has also accentuated the problem, all the other uh, factors uh, that uh, lead to an acceleration of zoonosis. And we can see already the impact in many countries, especially in developing um, countries. So overall, the spillover has three components and three spillover boundaries. So the, these components are the reservoir component, the intermediate host or vector component, and the final or focal uh, host component. The reservoir component, is, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, the population or the environment where the pathogen is endemic. And this uh, pathogen can be transmitted directly to the final host or be transmitted first to the intermediary host or vector where it's amplified or further adapted before jumping on to the final uh, host, which could be usually when we talk about final host, we mean, uh, we mean humans, but it could also mean uh, domesticated animals or an animal that is near extinction. So the jump from the reservoir component to the intermediate vector happens usually through transmission bottlenecks, as we call them, which means that only few particles of the pathogen are adapted enough to cross the spillover boundary into the intermediary host. And the end result is either the uh, final infection uh, is a dead-dead infection and stops there, it's a stuttering, it could be a stuttering um, transmission chain, which means that the um, pathogen, virus or bacterial uh, infection continues for a while, but then eventually is confined and is eliminated. Or the third option is that it could become, cause an epidemic outbreak, which if it's, if it's not properly managed, it could lead to an adaptation of the pathogen and the pathogen then becomes endemic in the human or the animal um, population. So uh, the stages of the emergence of a typical uh, zoonotic pathogen or a virus in this case is that first the pathogen evolves, evolves enough or uh, in the reservoir or the population of the reservoir increases substantially. And then we have a spillover event uh, of the pathogen into the humans then the humans disperse the pathogen across geographic barriers and the virus becomes an epidemic if it's located in a defined geographical area or pandemic if it's a, a larger uh, area, um, more two, two or more countries or continents causing major socioeconomic impacts similar to what we experience currently with COVID-19. Uh, and then there are three um, scenarios for the impact of the virus and this depends on the management of the virus or the pathogen. 
So the first one is if our management uh, of the disease fails, then the impact continues to be uh, high in societies and economies. If we manage to um, reduce the impact somehow, then um, our, if our management is good enough to confine the virus to a certain extent, then we can see a reduced impact. And then if our management is really good, for example, when we find vaccines or efficient drugs and we eliminate the virus or the pathogen, then the third impact uh, is uh, the best, where we don't have any impact over time. So um, one uh, very good example of zoonotic uh, viruses are, is coronavirus, coronaviruses. Um, and it would have been a very important omission not to discuss uh, coronaviruses. These are very important zoonotic single-stranded RNA uh, viruses that cause disease both in humans and in animals. Um, they are classified into four genera, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta coronaviruses. And they're found in uh, mice, uh, bats, and birds, uh, uh, but also in humans. They're, uh, seven uh, coronaviruses that infect humans, and they're shown here in this phylogenetic tree with the blue uh, color. And four of them, uh, two alpha and two beta coronaviruses, are the second main cause after rhinoviruses of the common cold. They make up almost 15% of the cases of common cold. And these viruses have been known to circulate in human population for a long time, but they haven't received much attention because the disease that they cause is relatively mild, uh, mild respiratory symptoms. But this all changed in 2002 uh, when a beta coronavirus called SARS emerged. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And this virus emerged in China from bats. Um, this virus um, spread across the world, uh, causing hundreds of deaths. Um, um, due to a respiratory syndrome that it caused, uh, but it was contained uh, in a relatively short time. And it sort of showed us, expanded sort of our perception of how um, uh, coronaviruses from bats can actually become pandemic uh, threats. In 2012, a second um, a better coronavirus emerged, uh, this time in the Middle East, uh, again from bats, uh, which was called MERS. MERS or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And this uh, virus was far more lethal than SARS. However, it didn't transmit well between humans. It was uh, contained and eliminated also in a short time. And as you all know, in December 2019, another beta coronavirus emerged from China uh, from a wet lab, a wet market, which is a wild animal market uh, in Wuhan uh, in China. Uh, it uh, transmits through respiratory droplets and causes a range of symptoms uh, from flu-like symptoms to serious respiratory distress and sometimes death. So as of yesterday, there were more than 17 uh, million confirmed cases worldwide and almost 670, uh, more than 670,000 uh, deaths at a global level. So the first question is why SARS-CoV-2 is killing more people and more quickly than the other two um, coronaviruses, SARS and MERS. So usually epidemiologists who describe diseases, viral diseases or any disease actually, they use uh, two numbers, the R0 or R0, which is the average number of people that an individual can be expected to infect and that tells us, um, uh, that denotes the, how contagious and how, and how infectious a virus is, and the case fatality rate, which is a proportion of death compared to uh, the total number of people which were diagnosed with a disease. And this um, gives us information about how lethal a virus is. So if we see this table here, we can see that COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2 uh, is uh, twice more infection, infectious and 30 times more lethal than flu, which is caused uh, by influenza virus, an entirely uh, different virus.
And I included flu in this table because uh, there was a lot of uh, misconception at the beginning of the pandemic uh, that COVID-19 is just another flu. Well, it isn't. So an another thing in this table, which is interesting, is that SARS-CoV-2 is uh, less contagious than SARS and uh, less lethal than both SARS and MERS. So the question is, how um, can this virus be so frighteningly successful compared to SARS and MERS? So some people say that this is partly due to the unknown spillover reservoir of the virus. Because if we knew the reservoir or its intermediate cost, we could break the chain of the infection. However, now the virus is well established in the human population. So in my opinion, the most important factor is that the virus has a long incubation period and that asymptomatic and presymptomatic patients can transmit the virus leading to a widespread community transmission, which is not easily controlled. Uh, unlike SARS and MERS, which were more confined into hospitals and they could be far better um, uh, controlled and confined. And of course, there are many more uh, unknown factors that we don't know yet or that relate perhaps to molecular virology, uh, the epidemiology or the immunopathology of the virus. All of these uh, remain, will remain to be seen. So um, human coronaviruses emerge uh, from animals, uh, mainly mice and bats, and the transfer jump to humans uh, with mutation and adaptation, and they do so via intermediary uh, hosts. For example, SARS it jumps from bats first to uh, civet cats or raccoon dogs, according to some, and then jump to humans. Um, uh, MERS jumps from bats first to camels and then jumps to humans. There's been a lot of discussion and controversy about the origin of SARS uh, COVID-2, including conspiracy theories that the virus uh, was constructed in a lab or it escaped uh, from a lab. Nowadays, we have very good virological evidence that the virus uh, must have originated uh, from bats. So the SARS-CoV-2 genome is unusually big for a virus. It's almost 30,000 nucleotides. And just to give you a measure, flu is 14,000. Uh, nucleotides. So when researchers sequenced the new uh, coronavirus, they started comparing it with coronaviruses um, with other sequences of coronavirus that already existed in many different species. And they found that it resembled a lot to some of the coronaviruses uh, that came from, that circulate in bats. So as you can see in this genome similarity plot, uh, the genome of SARS-CoV-2 is approximately 60 to 70 percent similar um, to that um, of SARS-1 or SARS-CoV, which is shown here with a red color, and also similar to other coronaviruses that are found in bats with the green and the pink color. But it's really interesting, though, that the genome of SARS-CoV-2 is highly similar, approximately 96 um, percent similar to that of the coronavirus that is found in Chinese horseshoe bats, shown here with a blue color, um, that's, um, that has been detected, identified some time ago in Chinese horseshoe bats. So uh, these two viruses, the SARS-CoV-2 and uh, the RATIG-13 uh, virus, which is shown here again with a blue color, and are di differ by approximately uh, 1,000 nucleotides. Um, as you can see, uh, the distribution of these differences is, is equal again across the genome. So it's, these differences are distributed normally across the genome, which suggests that the virus, SARS-CoV-2, may have emerged from the bat coronaviruses with natural evolution or natural mutation rather than a synthetic process, some people claim. Because if it was a synthetic process, we would have um, a more, uh, uh, you know, um, we would see a mutation at a specific point of the uh, genome. So when we cluster phylogenetically all the, um, 
uh, all the coronaviruses, we can see that RATI G13 is clustered along with the, um, uh, the novel coronavirus and they form a distinct lineage, the closest relative to uh, SARS-CoV-2, which makes a, a very strong case that the virus actually came from bats. So the uh, identity of the intermediary host of uh, SARS-CoV-2 is not so clear. Um, and we believe that there is an intermediary host for SARS-CoV-2, similar to MERS and SARS, uh, for several reasons, one of them is that the cell receptor um, of the virus in bats is very different from that in humans, which suggests that the, um, the virus must have been adapted in another species before it jumped to humans. We also suspect that there's an intermediary cost because the uh, pandemic started in the winter when bats are known to hibernate and therefore they couldn't possibly transmit directly uh, to humans. The many uh, theories on to which one is the intermediary host of um, SARS-CoV-2, including snakes, um, raccoon dogs, uh, but the most, the stronger candidates are pangolins, uh, which are these really uh, shy and charming animals that are, that are anteaters that are found in Asia and in Africa, and they are heavily trafficked for their meat and scales, uh, which are used as a delicacy and also used in traditional medicine, in particular in Southeast Asia. So research has found uh, that pangolins uh, carry coronaviruses that are very similar to SARS-CoV-2, and also that the cell receptor of SARS-CoV-2 is well concerned in pangolins and it's similar to that of humans. However, uh, more surveillance studies are needed to confirm that pangolins are indeed um, the, the intermediary host uh, of SARS-CoV-2 and they, that they do have a role in the emergence of the virus. But still, we have some evidence, but not definitive uh, evidence. However, more and more people uh, now agree that the virus uh, must have come from bats as many other uh, human infecting uh, viruses. So a lot of people are asking why bats, why do they carry all these uh, deadly zoonotic uh, viruses? So bats are the only flying mammals and they have a unique immune system uh, that allows them to carry asymptomatically without getting sick, many deadly viruses such as Ebola or Marburg virus Kendra and Nipah virus that cause disease in humans and animals in Southeastern Asia and Australia. So the consensus theory is that the centuries of uh, evolution uh, or, uh, caused um, their immune system to change um, and this was due to their flying ability. So the flying ability after years of evolution affected their immune system which became more susceptible to all these viruses. So the reason that we see more and more um, uh, zoonotic viruses coming from bats uh, is mainly due to human activities. Uh, obviously bats are hunted and eaten or consumed. Um, so there's a lot of illegal trade um, with uh, bats, uh, but more importantly, it's the deforestation, uh, the urbanization and the climate change that I mentioned earlier that sort of expanded the interface between bat populations and human populations, creating hot spots, as they're called, of disease transmission of pathogens from bats uh, to humans. And there is a study from the World Health Organization uh, that showed that the highest risk hotspots for disease transmission from bats are West and Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. And they based their findings on the diversity and the numbers of bats and also the human population the, and the agricultural uh, activity. Bats are really diverse, there are more than 1,300 um, bats uh, worldwide that are currently known, there may be more. Um, regarding coronaviruses, um, there are studies that show that approximately 500 coronaviruses have already been identified in Chinese bats, and there are estimates that they actually exceed 5,000 uh, coronaviruses just in Chinese bats. 
Um, we suggest, in my opinion, that we, uh, we will have another uh, pandemic uh, coronavirus strain sometime uh, in the future. And this is why I think that all these conspiracy theories that the virus may have emerged from uh, a lab is actually misleading and uh, because it distracts us from the actual problem, which is the destruction of the ecosystem and the natural um, habitats. So the, um, as I mentioned, one of the key um, uh, factors that make bats so successful in them being um, uh, natural reservoirs of so many animals is their diversity, their biodiversity, their richness. And the host species richness is an important predictor of disease emerging. So the more uh, host species you have, the more uh, diversity of viruses you're meant to have, and the more likely um, you, there is that the uh, uh, zoonotic disease will emerge. And conversely, when you have few host species, you have low diversity of virus and less likely for zoonotic disease to emerge. Recently, though, there has been another theory, uh, which is called the dilution effect. And this hypothesis suggests that the net effect of biodiversity, host and non-host animals, reduce the risk of certain diseases in ecological communities. So the concept is that the um, more biodiverse uh, an environment is, you will have more um, alternative hosts for pathogen, which sort of will dilute uh, will create a dilution effect and will decrease the risk of emergence of zoonotic disease. And this uh, sort of came out of studies on Lyme disease, which is a tick-borne disease, and they found that when ticks had more animals to take their bloody meals from, uh, there were a lot of wasted transmission events and they led to less uh, spillover uh, events. So that shows that how connected host by diversity and ecology is with the emergence of zoonotic diseases. Now, with all this distraction of natural habitats, the disturbance of ecosystems with the change of land use or with fires, um, this uh, could lead to a biodiversity loss and in turn will increase the risk for emergence of uh, new uh, zoonotic uh, pathogens. So another reason that we um, see an increase of um, zoonotic disease is that many of these pathogens remain undiscovered or unclassified. So if we, um, there are 8.7 million eukaryotic species uh, on Earth, if we assume that 10 viruses approximately infect each one of them, then we only, uh, the non-classified viruses form 0.005% of the total number of viruses, and the human viruses are 0.0003%, and the rest 99.99% are currently unknown. But just shows you that there are more, uh, far more zoonotic viruses out there remain to be seen and will cause trouble at some point uh, in the future. So just to add a fresh uh, in your virology um, before I continue to the examples of zoonosis. Um, so viruses uh, have, uh, uh, can have different structures. They can be uh, helical, icosahedral, or more complex. As you know, are a cellular, they are obligate intracellular parasites and they have uh, in their middle, it's their genome. They all need to have a genome or which is called core, and it could be uh, DNA or RNA genetic material, never both. And this genetic material is then coated with a protein coat called capsid, and the nucleic acid along with the capsid form the nucleocapsid. And this nucleocapsid can be enclosed from a lipid bilayer membrane that is called envelope, where which one which has incorporated several proteins that can be called spikes with which the virus attaches to surfaces or penetrates them and inserts uh, the nucleic acid into them. So this lipid envelope is important and um, the viruses cannot make their own lipids and they take this lipid envelope from the membrane of the cell that they infected. And part of the reason that SOP and ethanol 
Uh, so we use shop and ethanol. It's because shop and ethanol destroy these lipid membrane. This is why uh, doctors ask us to wash our hands. So viruses are classified into DNA or RNA uh, viruses. Um, DNA viruses can be uh, usually double-stranded, but can be single-stranded, can be circular or linear. Now, RNA viruses are usually single-stranded, but could be uh, double-stranded. They could be uh, segmented uh, or into separate RNA pieces, or they could, be, um, they could have a continuous RNA genome. The single-stranded RNA genomes are often called positive sense or negative sense um, uh, RNA viruses. So that depends on the, RNA, on the type of RNA that they carry. If their RNA acts like mRNA, uh, which means that it's ready for immediate translation, then they're called positive sense RNA. If their RNA needs to be uh, converted into the complementary chain, uh, then they're called negative sense. RNA. Now, despite their differences, all viruses have polymerase. Polymerases, these enzymes mediate their application, and depending on the type of viruses, these polymerase could be a DNA or an RNA uh, polymerase. So, viruses evolve with mutation, and these mutations sort of persist with natural selection and allows them to escape the immune system of the host and allows them to develop drug and vaccine resistance. And this is part of the reason why we see, um, we use a different flu vaccine every year. The previous years, um, flu viruses have evolved and uh, they mutated and they can avoid, uh, they avoid the vaccines. So as I mentioned, RNA viruses mutate faster than DNA viruses. And this is due to the RNA dependent RNA polymerase which is error prone. And that means that unlike DNA polymerases, they don't have proofreading abilities. So what that means is that DNA polymerases during uh, DNA synthesis, they have proofreading abilities. So when there is a mistake done, a mismatching base, uh, they have an enzyme called dextronuclease, which uh, identifies the error and removes the offending base. So RNA viruses, don't have that usually. But that's a problem. The lack of a proofreading ability is a problem for larger um, viruses, such as coronaviruses, um, because uh, without some uh, mechanism, uh, all these mutations could actually become lethal and toxic for the virus. So they need to have some sort of mechanism to keep their genomes stable. So this um, is the unique characteristic of coronaviruses among viruses. They have a unique proofreading exoribonuclease, uh, exon, or NSP14, that it's called, which manages to keep the mutations uh, rate low and keeps their genomes relatively stable. And this is part of the reason that uh, SARS-CoV-2 has been found so far not to mutate at a high rate. And experts say that um, uh, they calculated that the mutation rate of SARS-CoV-2 is approximately four times uh, less slower than that of uh, seasonal flu. So of course, it's, this is fantastic news for vaccine researchers who work on vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. And hopefully we will have a vaccine uh, by the end uh, of the year. So um, a second example of zoonotic virus that we talked to you is uh, influenza viruses. Uh, so this is, as you know, one of the most common infectious diseases. Um, it's a highly contagious airborne disease, uh, causes an acute uh, febrile illness, and results in um, a range of symptoms from mild fatigue uh, to respiratory failure and sometimes even death. This is a single-stranded negative sense RNA viruses. There are four types of influenza virus, A, B, C, and D. Uh, but the most important ones are the A and B, which can cause uh, seasonal epidemics of disease, which is known as the flu season, which happens every winter. However, among these two viruses, only influenza A viruses can cause pandemics. So influenza A viruses are more uh, interesting for this reason. 
emerge from aquatic fish, which are the natural reservoirs of these viruses. And these uh, viruses circulate in birds and they accumulate mutations in the segments, which allows them then to cross uh, species and infect uh, livestock, such as chicken or pigs, sea mammals, horses, birds, and dogs, and of course, uh, humans, um, and causing epidemics and sometimes uh, pandemic diseases. So it's really important that influenza A viruses have a segmented RNA genome. They have eight viral genes segments in the genome, and each one of them codes for a functionally important protein Three of them encode subunits of the RNA polymerase, that is the nucleocapsid protein, the matrix protein, which is an ion channel, uh, maglutinin and neuraminidase, which I will talk a bit on the next slide, and the non-structural proteins, uh, which function is not entirely clear, but they seem to modulate the immune response of the cells that the virus infects. So the uh, most important uh, proteins uh, of the virus are the amaglutinins and neuraminidase, amaglutinin or HA or H, and neuraminidase or NA or N. And these are spikes that are expressed on the surface of the envelope of the virus. So amaglutinin is really important because it recognizes and binds to a cell receptor that for flu is sialic acid. And these are uh, small sugars that are found on uh, proteins on the surface of the cells. The concept of a cell receptor is really important in virology uh, because every virus uses a different receptor in order to invade cells. And this works a bit like the way a key uh, and lock. Um, so for example, for avian flu viruses, the avian flu viruses recognize a specific type of sialic acids that are found only um, on bird cells. And they cannot enter normally without mutation onto cells uh, that have human, onto human um, cells which carry a different type of sialic acid. And conversely, human flu viruses cannot enter um, bird, uh, cannot bind into bird sialic acid, and therefore they cannot enter normally um, uh, bird uh, cells. The only exception to this is uh, pigs. The pig cells carry both types of sialic acids and they can allow both avian and human flu viruses. And this is why they're considered a mixing vessel of flu virus because it allows both types of flu viruses to come in into the cells. So, um, after binding and recognizing the sialic acid receptor, then the virus is uh, then uh, enters uh, the cells. The viral membrane fuses with the membrane of the uh, cell. And then this is followed by a process called uncoating, which results into the release of the viral genome into the cytoplasm. The viral segments then are translocated to the nucleus of the cells, where the viral genome is replicated the viral proteins are transcribed and translated, and the new variants then, and along with the genome, are packaged into the new uh, viral, uh, uh, into the new viruses. And the new variants or viruses are then released from the cell in a process that is called budding. Now, neuraminidase uh, is a sialidase, an enzyme that cleaves sialic acids and has a dual role. The first one is at the cell entry, whereby cleaving sialic acids prevents the aggregation of virions on the surface of the cell. So it allows the cell to get into, the virus to get into the cells. And the second role is that it helps the release of the virus uh, from uh, the cells. So both homoglutinin and neuraminidase are therefore um, the determinants of virus infectivity, transmissibility, and pathogenicity. And they're really important. There are 18 different types of hemagglutinin and 11 different types of neuraminidase. And because of their importance, they give their names to subtypes of influenza virus. So you may have come across these really long names in papers or in the news. And these um, uh, letters 
uh, stand for, for example, the first letter A stands for the virus type, which is influenza A, it could be B or C. The second is the geographic origin. The third element is the strain number followed by the year of isolation and the virus subtype, H3 and 2. So this means that this virus has um, the hemagglutinin type 3 and the neuraminidase type 2. So there's a lot of talk about zoonotic influenza, um, but um, in order for a zoonotic influenza to become a truly human pandemic, it needs to cross three sets of barriers. So the first one is to cross from animal uh, to humans, to be able to transmit from animal to humans and bind to receptors on the cell surface, um, on the cell surface. And then it needs to be able to replicate in the cells. And the third barrier is that it needs to transmit uh, from one human to the other in order to become a truly uh, human uh, pandemic. So if the virus manages to cross uh, the barrier of the cell receptor, then it has more barriers. It needs to be able to replicate in the cells. And one of the major barriers is the viral polymerase, which does not function in all tissues, in all cell types and species. So we found that um, viral polymerase uh, of flu viruses, the viral polymerase of avian flu virus in particular, uh, grows very well, the viruses grow very well uh, in avian cells because um, and the polymerase of the avian flu viruses have high polymerase activity, but the avian flu viruses, they don't grow well in human cells and they have, and this is due to a low polymerase activity. And we found with work uh, here at Imperial that uh, this was due um, to a lack of 33 amino acids in the host protein ANPI32A, which interacts normally uh, with the polymerase. So uh, the avian ANPI32A has this extra 33 amino acid. And when we added the 33 amino acids into um, the human ANPI32A, this resulted uh, into a full replication of the avian flu viruses in human cells. So the flu, the bird flu viruses were able to grow in human cells. Another barrier is um, at the subunit PB2 of the polymerase and at the amino acid 627, which in avian flu viruses is a glutamic acid or E, while the human uh, flu viruses in the same position, the same amino acid, have a lysine or K. And a lot of research have shown that the mutation uh, from glutamic acid to lysine, E to K, can actually make the avian flu viruses able to grow into uh, human cells. So just a simple mutation from E to K. So um, it's also interesting that in bat flu viruses, at the same position, there is a serine. Um, and mam bats are also, um, it's important to remember that they are mammals. So there may be more adaptive mutations that allow avian flu viruses um, to grow into um, human uh, cells. So viruses apart from mutation, they also evolve with other mechanisms that are called recombination or reassortment. And recombination uh, happens in viruses with a continuous RNA genome, for example, the coronaviruses. So uh, in recombination, what happens is, uh, is when a cell is co-infected by two uh, different strains of viruses, during RNA synthesis, the RNA polymerase could actually switch from one template of RNA from one virus to the template of virus uh, of RNA from the other virus, leading to uh, production of viruses that have mixed RNA from two different viruses. So therefore, it is possible that SARS-CoV-2 uh, has emerged due to a combination event of a bat coronavirus with a coronavirus from another bat or from another species, for example, pangolin. Now, reassortment happens in viruses with a segmented RNA genome, like the influenza viruses, and it's basically the exchange of viral uh, gene uh, segments. 
So in Plu, we actually use the terms adigenic drift and sip. And these actually are the same. Adigenic drift is the same with adaptive mutation. And adigenic sip is also done genome reassortment or just reassortment. So the mutations or adigenic drift are actually usually small or larger mutations in the adigenic sites, uh, which are hemagglutinin and uraminidase usually. Uh, for example, mutations in the hemagglutinin would allow a virus to um, bind to another cell receptor that normally couldn't bind to. Or this mutation could result into inhibiting the binding of neutralizing antibodies, which are produced usually after vaccination, and thereby allowing a new subtype of virus um, to, um, uh, to spread to a population within a non-immune population, and therefore making vaccines completely uh, useless. So the adigenic shift, as I mentioned, is, uh, which results in the formation of a mosaic virus, is created by um, the exchange of genome segments during uh, replication. And I will show you some more examples later. So pandemics of influenza, there is a lot of uh, recorded uh, cases of human pandemic influenza, and some strains are even recorded uh, very recently, including H7N9 and an H1N1 virus, which was recorded in China, just uh, in pigs in China, just last month. So the most important uh, human pandemic strains in the last century, uh, based on the number of deaths, uh, was the 1918 H1N1 Spanish flu, uh, the 1957 H2N2 Asian influenza, and the 1962 Hong Kong influenza H3N2. So in particular, the 1918 uh, Spanish flu is considered um, a very important pandemic. And you probably have heard how uh, many times people compare the current pandemic with the Spanish flu. Um, Spanish flu infected almost one third of the world's population at the time and killed approximately 50 million people, which was more people than the number of people that they died during World War uh, I. So all these uh, pandemic flu viruses um, were generated by other adigenic drift or adigenic shift. Um, so the 1918 H1N1 Spanish flu was created by adigenic drift, where an avian virus was adapted to infect humans, and this caused the Spanish flu. The 1957 H2N2 virus was created by a reassortment of the Spanish flu H1N1 with an H2N2, and the new virus took three genetic segments um, from the avian virus, H2N2, and the rest from the H1N1 virus. The 1968 virus was again a result of reassortment between the Asian H2N2 virus and the H3 and an H3 avian virus. And the new virus had two genetic segments from the avian virus, five se segments from the 1918 um, uh, virus, and the, the last one was from the AIDS, from the Asian uh, flu virus. So the next pandemic flu virus could um, happen with either way, either the genic drift or SIP. And experts uh, believe that the uh, pandemic influenza is expected uh, every 10 years approximately based on patterns of previous uh, uh, pandemics. So just to summarize and make sure uh, that you're able to distinguish between zoonotic, seasonal, and pandemic uh, flu viruses. So um, there are a lot of flu viruses that circulate uh, within and among domestic and wild animal species, and all of them have the potential for adaptation and reassortment. So some of them are able to cross the species barrier and infect humans, and they're automatically called zoonotic. Then they could be reassorted or non-reassorted. And these virus could be pandemic or non-pandemic, and they could just form a new seasonal influenza strain that just circulates in human and animal populations. These zoonotic virus could potentially reassort with other viruses, animal or human seasonal viruses that are already in circulation, 
and create a new pandemic virus, uh, which again could cause a pandemic or it could become endemic and form part of the seasonal influenza uh, viral strains. So that shows you how important it is to identify the new um, viruses that circulate in domestic and uh, wild uh, animals. So the next part of the talk is how do we prevent zoonosis? How we make sure um, that we prevent them, we are able to control them. So I listed 10 approaches, although um, the, the best way to do it is just identifying the reasons, the factors, the drivers uh, that led to the emergence of zoonotic diseases and just, just tackle them. However, that's not so easy. You cannot reverse climate change so uh, easily. So one of the uh, approaches that I'm uh, recommending is that we need to understand better uh, the ecological, evolutionary, social, economic, and epidemiological mechanisms that affect the zoonosis persistence and emergence. Um, there's a lot of steps in this spillover process that we don't really understand or that are very poorly understand. As I mentioned with the example of bats, we need to regulate or ban wild animal trade and consumption. We need to protect uh, animal welfare, of course. Another very important um, approach is the pathogen discovery approach, where we need to discover uh, emerging zoonotic pathogens before they actually do the uh, cause a pandemic or an epidemic. So it's all about predicting or forecasting zoonotic pathogens. And I will give you a very brief overview of an example um, of um, an emerging zoonotic pathogen, potentially zoonotic. So uh, some years ago, um, the uh, scientists have identified uh, two um, unusual uh, flu viruses in bats which were very different from the classical flu viruses that are found in aquatic birds. And this sort of raised the concern that bats may actually be another reservoir of flu viruses that are actually more diverse than that of the classical flu viruses, and they could cause the next uh, pandemic. These viruses were so different that they gave them a completely different type of agglutinin and neuraminidase. They were named H17 and 10 and age 18 and 11, and they were found in bat populations across Latin America. So the fact that they were found in different bat species and also in different countries with huge differences between them, distances, suggests that the vi these viruses circulate uh, well between uh, bat populations. But the question was whether these viruses could transmit from bats to humans. So the first step towards answering that is to identify the kind of receptors that these viruses use in order to invade cells. So the way we uh, try to identify that is by using pseudotype viruses, which are replication deficient viruses that we make in the lab and we modify genetically so that they express hemagglutinins and neuraminidases of the bat flu viruses. And by making these pseudotype viruses, we were then able to infect uh, cell lines in the lab to see if they can enter, for example, human cell lines. And we found that they did. They do enter human cell lines, and that we found that they use a receptor called HLADR, which is found usually on the surface of immune cells, such as B cells or macrophages or dendritic uh, cells. And that sort of raised a concern whether bad flu can be the next pandemic, the next disease, X. My opinion is that this is most likely it's not. However, there are some scenarios that this could happen. The bats in Latin America are not consumed so much as in Africa and more in Asia. However, there's some uh, local indigenous populations that they do consume bats. Um, so exposure to bat blood or um, tissue could theoretically uh, become a pathway for the transmission of the virus from bats to humans. Another scenario involved these guys uh, called vampire bats or hematophagic bats uh, that uh, usually um, 
you know, suck blood from domestic animals such as um, uh, goats and cows, but sometimes they do attack uh, humans. Um, so it is theoretically possible that the virus uh, could transmit to uh, vampire bats, which live in the same areas with the other uh, viruses that carry the bat flu viruses, and actually they belong to the same family. And from them, they could either uh, transmit directly the virus to humans or uh, indirectly to humans via domestic animals. So just a scenario. We and others have done more work on these viruses and we found that these bad flu viruses, they don't reassort with the classical flu viruses. So the possibility that they will create a pandemic flu viruses is small. They, we found that they replicate poorly in mice and ferrets in the lab and they don't transmit via the air, via airborne droplets like the classical flu viruses. However, these viruses have more or less the same sort of structure with classical flu viruses. They're able to mutate, they're able to reassort between themselves, and more importantly, they're able to infect uh, human uh, cells. So the evidence so far shows that there is a limited spillover risk, but we cannot um, uh, rule out of hand uh, the possibility that these viruses could create uh, a zoonotic uh, transmission. So with this example, I wanted to show you that these are the sort of um, studies uh, that we need for many of the pathogens that circulate in wild and domesticated uh, animals. So um, apart from uh, the um, epidemic preparedness and forecasting uh, pandemics, we need to have surveillance systems in place uh, to forecast the emergence and re-emergence of viruses and also have rapid response systems in place uh, in all countries to tackle um, emerging zoonotic uh, pathogens. So the early detection and uh, the existence of control programs and rapid response uh, systems in place in places can actually reduce dramatically uh, the incidence of zoonotic diseases in uh, both people and animals. You can see in this graph with the green color uh, is the uh, incidence in animals and with the, with the blue color uh, is the incidence in uh, humans. So for all of this to happen, we need to educate uh, uh, better the public, uh, vets, farmers. Uh, we need to have the right legislative uh, framework uh, for all of this to be in place. Obviously, this is a global issue, so we need global coordination. Uh, for example, we need to, um, all countries need to implement the same international standards for reporting uh, animal diseases. Again, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is a one health issue. Uh, we need uh, collaboration of experts from many different um, uh, sectors we cannot let our guard down because um, there are many possibilities for the emergence of new zoonotic diseases. And I hopefully we will learn from uh, our experience with COVID-19. It will be, and we will be more prepared uh, in the future. Um, so um, finally, we need, of course, uh, above everything else to protect the ecosystem uh, the um, biodiversity and the natural habitats of wild animals. Uh, and I'd like to finish off my talk by uh, reminding um, that COVID-19 is above everything else an environmental uh, wake up uh, call. And with that, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, once again, thank you as well uh, for the opportunity to talk about uh, zoonosis. And thank you all, and I'm happy to um, take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, our speakers. Uh, I think, oh, can you hear me? I, yeah. I think it's a very great presentation, very clear and very informative. I think the topics covered are very helpful for our audience. I already saw in the comments that some, uh, some people say it's the best expo lecture ever. Thank you very much. And I also am um, glad that you mentioned that the argument that um, the COVID-19 is lab created 
um, it's quite misleading. I think I agree with you. I think it's quite sad that the pandemic is played by the politicians. So, um, well, I really hope everyone here is safe and healthy. Um, so um, I know our lecture was originally um, uh, scheduled for one hour, but will you be able to- I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I think no one against that is really helpful. Um, so will you be able to stay for a little bit longer to answer some questions? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to stay, yes. Oh, thank you so much. So, um, so everyone, uh, if you have any question, please raise your hand. Use the raise hand fun uh, function in the Zoom. So our XVAL pander will uh, guide you to, to let you know when you are unmuted. Oh, I can see three participants come. Uh, uh, uh. So what do I do? I just unmute them. So, uh, I Panda's here, and uh, let me do my magic. <laughs> oh, I, I think I just, uh, I think I've just unmuted somebody, but let's go. Uh, Ajmer, I cannot hear you. Can you? Can you hear me? Yes. All oh, right, okay. So, blah, 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 blah. Let, let's see. Shall I uh, unmute someone of the people who have raised their hands? Yeah, um, I, found, I, I found muted somebody, but they're not responding. So let me okay. try someone else. Uh, oh, yeah, here we have um, um, Dr. Dr. Utpal Das. Utpal, yes. Hi, Utpal. Yes, uh, I know that uh, zoonosis is the uh, 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 disease or infections naturally transmitted from animal to human and vice versa. But uh, you referred that uh, zoonosis is uh, the infection or diseases which are transmitted from animal to human. Is it? Yes. That's right. Oh. Huh. So, sorry, is, is this your question? I didn't understand fully what you're asking, though. No, I am asking that zoonosis are the diseases or infections naturally transmitted from animal to human and vice versa. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Huh. Yes, huh. they transmitted uh, from uh, uh, animals to. Uh, to humans, but they can also be transmitted huh. from humans to animals. And huh. in this case, huh. 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 to distinguish them, we call them reverse zoonosis or anthropozoonosis. In huh. some literature, they call all of them zoonosis. And you may find in the literature that every any disease that is transmitted from animals to human or humans to animals, it's also called zoonosis. But I think recently, more and more people are distinguishing the two mm -hmm. different types. The ones that come from mm -hmm. animals, the ones we call zoonosis, and the other ones, other anthropozoonosis, and okay, okay. Mm -hmm. one in Greek to zoo mm -hmm. animal again in Greek. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Okay. The next question. Uh, I'll mute it. I, I do cool Sunday. Hello, Aituku. Hi. Hi there. So, th yeah, thanks for your great presentation. I want to really ask, um, for example, in Nigeria, we've been having uh, people with uh, COVID-19, especially those with uh, underlying problem like diabetes, usually dying as a result of COVID-19. Uh, do you have, I, don't, I know your lecture is like, is not uh, like public health related uh, based, but can you really explain the interrelationship between the diabetes and COVID-19 and the deaths from the patients? Um, this is um, something that which is um, not qualified, obviously, to answer this. Um, but it, it, this is something that people are working on. And this is all have to do with the cytokine storm that SARS-CoV-2 um, does. So um, SARS-CoV-2, like 
some uh, uh, few flu viruses, when they enter, and not to all people, um, they can induce a cytokine storm, which means um, an aberrant, um, unbalanced inflammatory response in some of the patients, which uh, causes all the um, negative um, effects that you see in severe forms of COVID disease. So it seems that people with um, a precondition, diabetes, um, or another cancer patients, or another um, uh, other people who are immunocompromised or are too old, um, they tend to have this response to the virus. They have an unbalanced pro-inflammatory response. All these pro-inflammatory cytokines are expressed in their lungs, which then dis disrupt the tissue structure and causes the respiratory distress that you see. Now, the specific link to diabetes has not been found, but it might be a very general one that the people with diabetes have a weaker immune system than an average healthy uh, otherwise person. I don't know if that is something that answers your question. I think you are muted, Aidoko. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's a good response. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, Kasmir, Kasmir Duzi. Hello, yeah, Kasmir. Well, yeah. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Hi, Kasmir. Yeah. Good afternoon. Also, I really appreciate your wonderful lecture. That's nice. Uh, my question is like this. Uh, uh, Concerning the, uh, the emphasis you read about the virus, DNA virus, and the uh, nursing disease, uh, what are the level of collaboration between the vet doctors and the human doctors in achieving the in finding the way to solve the issue that they are managing from the uh, nursing disease? Because uh, we can see that most of the virus we are experiencing come from the animals, especially wild animals. What are the level of collaboration in able to? or stay displayed between the vet doctors and the uh, animal doctors, vet doctors and the human doctors to protect the disease being, uh, that used to come from the uh, uh, wild animals. Thank you, doctor. Kasmir, I'm sorry I missed most of your talk. It's not a very good, um, uh, I don't know if you wanna yeah. also write the question. It might be quicker for me. Right. The, the signal is not very good, I think, either on my side or your side. I'm not entirely sure. Okay, let me increase, let me increase my distance. Can you hear me now? Yeah, Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's much better now. Okay, okay. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, I'm asking oh, what are the level of... Yeah, yeah. It, it, I cannot hear you well <laughs> for some reason. I'm, I missed most of the question. Okay, my question goes like this. Uh, based on your analysis uh, concerning the zombie disease, most of the viruses that came from uh, animals. So I'm asking what are the collaboration between the vet doctors and the human doctors to ensure that the uh, disease is curtailed because most of these emanates from the uh, animal and, then, and most viruses as well we experience in this uh, generation now. I'm asking what are the collaboration in the area of research in finding the uh, vaccine and the uh, development of vaccine and the aspect of the the DNA and then you mentioned about which one I can inhibit this vaccine or try and error. I want to know more. Thank you. Uh, so you're asking about the error prone RNA polymerase, am I right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. uh, most RNA viruses, actually all RNA viruses, apart from coronaviruses, they don't have uh, all the RNA polymerase is error prone. They don't have an exonuclease. The exception to this rule are only coronaviruses, and it's part of why they're so successful. So, yeah. uh, because otherwise, um, I, I can't remember if I mentioned it, if uh, coronaviruses would have such a big genome compared to all the other RNA viruses, if they didn't have some sort of exonuclease or some sort of way to maintain the viral genomes, they would have died. They, all the mutations would have make them, some of these mutations would have been lethal, they would have been unsteady viruses that they couldn't okay. survive. So okay. a secret of their success 
is that they have this particular protein, NSP14, which acts as a proofreader. So it goes through during RNA synthesis when the RNA uses, uh, the, when uh, is, RNA synthesis happens using RNA uh, as a template. So it goes through all of this while it's building each one of the base pairs and make sure there's no error. Uh, I think that's a very important uh, step in the um, molecular virology of coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2 in particular. I don't know if that answers your question, Kazmir. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So let's try another one. So try to unmute Vat Solo. Vat Solo. Um, that solo is not responding. <laughs> oh, there it is. Hello, that solo. Hello, 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 hello. Yeah, thank you very much for the educative lecture. Now, please, my question goes thus. Between 2002 to this period, we had had like three different pandemic, the Middle Eastern Respiratory syndrome, the uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, and the swine acute diarrhea. And then we are now having the COVID-19, which are all caused by coronavirus. Now, looking, th looking at it from a veterinary perspective, do you advise screening of animal for coronaviruses? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's a key thing. Initially, um, I wanted to include some more uh, slides about what we as vets could do, but I think that um, one of the most important things is to screen animals for coronaviruses, new or older coronaviruses, and then sequence them exactly the same way they do now with humans. I think we need to do the same with coronaviruses. The links between um, human and animal coronavirus are well established, and I think that uh, international funding bodies should now uh, get a grip and fund um, uh, similar studies worldwide. I mean, uh, especially in Africa, where we know that there are a lot of coronaviruses that are undetected. For example, personally, I'm looking into coronaviruses in bats from Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm looking Thank forward if anyone, any, anyone is doing similar work anywhere in Africa to collaborate with. Okay, okay. Could we get back to you through your email? The email you left behind, could we get back to you via your email as, as regard to collaboration? So, sorry, I missed that. What do you mean by email? You, you, you spoke about collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by all means, in, in my last slide, I have my email, or you can find me online, drop me an email, and you okay. can take it from there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we have one more who just hand. So Pharma Pri Manu Hanu. Yes, speaking. Uh, there is one question. Uh, it is regarding the why is COVID nineteen very stable virus? It is not affected by the temperature and climate, humidity, everything. Why is not affected by these things? What is the reason behind the quality of the virus? Yeah, so uh, something I didn't mention, obviously, there's no always enough time to go through details. We can see mutations. The SARS-CoV-2 uh, does uh, has a mutation rate. It's just four times less than flu, uh, but it does mutate. And there are recently some uh, papers, scientific papers, that showed some important mutations one in particular in China, which made it more infectious in the lab. It, 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 it could infect cells better, but it didn't transmit so well uh, among humans. So these mutations can actually be, um, not, they're not always good for the virus. It could actually mutate and become uh, less infectious or less lethal. Um, so now how, why it maintains and it's maintained, it's, I think it's something that has to do generally 
um, with coronaviruses. One of them is what we discussed before about um, the RNA polymerase, the fact that they have an exonuclease that is a proofreader. That is one reason. Uh, it seems to be um, a pretty robust virus. It's not easily destroyed as easily as we initially um, thought. Um, so I think these are the two um, reasons. One thing that I would like personally to know more about is why does it have such a long incubation period? That's an important question to ask. Remember, this is a virus that appeared a uh, few months ago. So there's still a lot that we don't know or we don't fully understand. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, Thank you very much. Thanks. So I guess that's our, our last question. Um, so the lecture will be recorded um, for those who are asking for the slides. You can go back to watch these lectures um, on our website or our YouTube channel. And also you're probably aware that I put a link in the chart for the feedback form. So um, this feedback form, I think is particularly this time relevant for everyone because it's related to your preferred arrangement for our coming lectures from September. I know some of you may go back, oh sorry, <laughs> some of you may go back to, um, to, to study or work from September. So, and also many of you mentioned that you want more systematic, intense learning with more interactive learning environments so that you can have more personal discussion with our brilliant speakers around the world. So that is why we're currently thinking about developing some formal training courses. So we need your opinion on that. Um, we're probably hoping to have the first trial course in August this year, so next month. So, um, so probably let us know what's your opinion on that. Because XVAL is a very tiny social enterprise with very limited resources. So we only want to create the support and resource that really makes difference for you. So, um, <clears throat> So uh, I don't know if staff is know that we have a uh, XVAL tradition. So at the end of every um, lecture, we will ask all the participants to turn on your camera to share, uh, to show our appreciation um, to your, your contribution. So um, our XVAL Panda, are you ready to unmute everyone? So we will give you probably um, like 20 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so, so much. Thank you so much, everyone. It's always very touching to see a lot of your face and from different backgrounds and culture. It's really touching. So thank you for joining us for every session. And our next session will be next uh, Tuesday. Yeah, so thank you very much, Stathis. Um, so see you next session. Thank you all for attending. This has been great. Very inspiring initiative. Well done. Uh, thank you so much for the great talk. <laughs> yeah.
and uh, I, I will see see you all next week. So everyone, take care and be well. See you next time. Bye bye. Bye.